go on deviant art and download poems that other people have written <laughs> and just sing the poems over the chords that we arranged oh and I was like ah oh, I can do this this is pretty fun Sidewalk talk today. I'm here with Flexibillion. You alright? How you doing? <laughs> so requested. Oh yeah? Yeah. Nice. So you're originally born in, is it how you say it? Like Tochester or? I'm um, Toaster. Toaster. Oh that's how you so say like, Toaster. Like a toaster. Yeah. <laughs> are your parents originally from there as well? I'm um, from the Midlands. Oh okay. So it's like, yeah just north of London basically. Mm -hmm. so all around an area. Yeah. Called like Luton and St Albans is where, mm -hmm. where my family's from. Wait, so what do your parents do? Not much, really. My <laughs> mum looks, at, so nothing in music. It's yeah. Like nothing in like the creative industry. My mum is a care worker. Oh, so okay. She, yeah, looks after old people and is just like quite an eccentric, mad woman. <laughs> so like she was like makes cakes and makes jewelry and. But she yeah. sounds creative though. Yeah, she is actually really creative. So her <laughs> dad, my granddad, was a guitarist and a singer oh. and a writer in a skiffle band. What was the name? Um, it's Johnny Christmas and the Sunspots. Oh, okay. Was the name of the band. Yeah. So yeah, growing up, he was always like, yeah, talking about music and playing guitar. So yeah, I got a lot of inspiration. But my dad was, I think he was, I don't know my dad that well, but he worked as an accountant. But in his spare time, he would build computers from scratch. Oh, wow. And then make his own music videos by like filming stuff off a of TV. And cutting it. That's crazy. This was, what, what was this like 20, 30 years ago? Um, yeah, so when I was about, I'd say about 25 years ago. Yeah. It was really, yeah, so I grew up listening to like Frank Zappa and Stranglers and Moxie music, like really quite wild avant garde stuff. Because my dad used to love cutting videos yeah. and making stuff. Yeah. That's so cool. So did your granddad teach you uh, instruments then? Um, nah. I kind of always taught myself. I like had a, it was my other granddad that got me my first guitar, oddly enough. Oh wow. And I just, I would play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on it, which sounds complicated, but it's not, it's like three <laughs> notes. And then my parents bought me a little keyboard and I learned Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on that. And then I got a violin from like the trash. Yeah. <laughs> and learned Beethoven's Night from that. Are you just obsessed with Beethoven? When I was a kid, yeah, that was, I no knew. Way. It's really, I think ninth is, it's either ninth or seventh, is the duh, 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 yeah. duh, Ode to Joy. Mm -hmm. And it's really simple. It's like all the white notes on a, on a piano. So I was really fascinated with being able to play that on a variety of instruments. Do you like other classical <laughs> music in general or were you just like a Beethoven <laughs> stan? <laughs> I don't even remember really being a music fan, like yeah. when I was really young. But I obviously was, I don't know, something about the playing the keyboard really fascinated me. Mm. Just because it is, yeah. Were you in some bands then? When I got, so yeah, when I got older, I got an electric guitar and then started teaching myself songs like Nirvana and System of a Down and yeah. all the other songs that everyone learns. And joined the band with Sean, who is Dr. P, mm -hmm. when I was about 12 or 13. Were you classmates or always, how did you meet him? He was like three years older. Okay. And he was the only guy in my small town that played drums. Oh. So I was like, I befriended him because I knew that he played drums. <laughs> At school, he used to walk home from school like, yeah, we'd never, it's quite a small town, so we'd never get picked up in the car. Yeah. And he was, always used to walk home on the same route. So I used to shout at him <laughs> until he finally turned around and started talking to me. And I was like, I've got a guitar, you've got drums, let's make a band. <laughs> and then, yeah, we mainly played covers, but I kind of then taught myself how to play drums oh, wow. by when he wasn't playing, I'd play on his drum kit. Did you, what was your name? <laughs> Did you have a name together? Well, our first band name was Flux Pavilion. Oh, Weirdly so enough. it was nothing before. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So I was, I was about 13, 12, 13 at the time. Yeah. And then 
Yeah, we actually changed our name to Goulip. Was the band name? Yeah, but we didn't release like original. It was all covers with Goulip. Oh, um, I see. So yeah, I guess then that's when I started writing songs because I'd learned all the power chords to play other people's songs. So I rearranged them and then used to write my own weird words, like or go on deviant art and download poems that other people have written <laughs> and just sing the poems over the chords that we arranged. Oh my God. And I was like, ah, oh, I can do this, this is pretty fun. Then I started learning more and getting to know certain chords and then writing my own songs. But it was never, I never like learned how to write songs or, you know, there was no YouTube. There was no like how to play guitar on YouTube kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I just had one and it was interesting and it was something to do. So I just kept going and kept at it. For, and then, yeah, it yeah. got better, basically, sort of naturally. Did you perform live, like the two of you back then? Yeah, well, we had a bass player as well. Oh, wow. So it was a three-piece. Damn. We did, yeah, my first ever show was when I was 13. I think it was on like my 13th birthday, just after. And we played in the, yeah, the town near us called Northampton. Played at a place called the Road Mender, which was like the biggest venue in the whole town. Oh, wow. So it was like going from never performing. I think my first show was actually in front of all of our nans. It was like <laughs> our bass player went to our bass player's nan's house, and then my nan, and then Sean's nan all came. And I don't know, our granddads weren't there. I think my mum might have been there, but yeah, it was mostly our nans. And we played our songs to them. That was our first ever show. <laughs> And was that more rock, or was it starting to get more like dubstep? Um, it was just bad rock, <laughs> I guess. It's like a 13-year-old that can play power chords. Yeah. Whatever that is. I used to have long hair as well. My hair was like down to here. But yeah, like electronic music didn't come for ages. Mm -hmm. I sort of joined another band playing drums, and then. We needed new songs, so I, I couldn't write a band song on my own because I did, like you need all the people. Mm. But on the computer I could make the drums and the bass and the keys. I could make it all in this program called Reason. Yeah. So that's what got me into electronic music, was trying to write songs for my band without them being there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I'd do it all electronically. And then that, I got good at kind of like making band music sound more interesting. So when we did our recordings, I'd be like, oh, I could record a three part harmony on the chorus just on my own in my bedroom. Yeah. I was like, oh, I can add an extra kick drum here on my own in my bedroom. I don't need a real human being to do it. And then that got me into hip hop. Oh, okay. I started thinking, oh, this is probably close to how they make hip-hop beats. So Flux Pavilion was originally a hip-hop, trip-hop kind of thing, like yeah. Bonobo. It was like Mr. Scruff and Bonobo and all this kind of like really weird sample-based stuff. And, and then, yeah, Dubstep yeah. was just a, a mistake <laughs> that, it, that that happened to be the thing. I didn't wake up and be like, Dubstep's my calling. I just really loved the sound and it was quite close to some of the stuff I was already working on. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of stepped to the side into dubstep and yeah. then that became the thing like yeah that took me away and do you remember how, uh, how you originally found Rusko and Casper um yeah I went to university when I was 19 and we were obviously didn't I didn't know anyone I didn't have any friends I was just like there on my own and I mentioned it were like my, I did a music course and we all had to get up and talk about what, who we are, what music we like to make. And I mentioned the words drum and bass. And then some guy called Wilbur came up to me afterwards and was like, really shy, like, oh, hey, do you like drum and bass? <laughs> like, oh yes, yes, I like drum and bass. It's like, oh, I do too. Come, do you wanna to come to my house and listen to some? So then, yeah, I went there. And then he was like, oh, there's also this stuff called dubstep. And then played me Casper and Rusko, Fabric 37 which is like a mix that they did. And it was just me and him sat in his bedroom, didn't know each other, just listening to Casper and Rusko, being like, oh yeah, this is nice. <laughs> oh, I like this one. It was like <laughs> the most opposite 
experience yeah. what you imagine. <laughs> Most people are like, oh, I went to a rave, it was huge. I was just like, sat there, really nervous, trying to make a new friend. <laughs> but I was like, this is great. And then we became good friends. I made another friendship group, and that's all we listened to. Yeah. Is dubstep. And we'd go into London and see Casper and Roscoe play and stuff like that. Yeah, didn't, um, was it Roscoe who was wearing the, like, the bird cardboard hat? It was the first, <clears throat> I've only ever been to like three shows that I haven't played at. And it was the first one I went to Fabric to see Casper and Roscoe, because we all loved the Fabric mix that he did. And yeah, he was, he had no shoes on and was sliding all over the place. <laughs> and had, I think it was from like a McDonald's Happy Meal. <laughs> Or like Burger King, this kind of like weird paper bird hat, and was just shouting on the mic, and basically was just a lunatic. Now, I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't that. But seeing <laughs> him do that, that's what started dubstep for me. I like the music, but I always thought, you know, drum and bass is really kind of like quite gangster. It's all, I don't know, like London, mm -hmm. South London, everyone's got their hoods up and dubstep and grime, it was always like a really aggressive kind of environment that I felt like I was too scared to get involved in. Mm. And then house music was just, you know, guys in nice shirts, <laughs> Gucci, wearing Prada, whatever it is, it's like <laughs> going to Ibiza, like really rich, really, I don't know, I was just a student. I would buy all my clothes from like charity shops and just didn't feel like I belonged in dance mm -hmm. music until seeing Roscoe play. And I was like, this guy's insane and eccentric. And he's nothing like anything I've ever really seen in electronic music outside of people like Prodigy and Chemical Brothers, which were too, they were too big for me to aspire to be. Mm. Prodigy was so huge. I was like, I'll never be like that. Whereas Roscoe was just there just a guy doing his thing. Mm -hmm. And that was the most inspiring night yeah, of my life, I'd say, mm -hmm. seeing him play. And how else would you describe <coughs> yourself back then growing up? You were doing a lot of badminton, right? No, I was younger. Yeah. I was quite into badminton <laughs> and cricket. <laughs> just all the classic British pastimes. Were you competing a lot in badminton? No, nah, I was never that sporty. I say badminton because that was the, the only one that I was slightly good at. <laughs> I still wasn't that good at it. And you did like painting and stuff? Um, I or you won some awards for painting? <coughs> yeah, I did win an award at art class. I did like a, um, a picture of my school with the top coming off, with a hand coming out. So someone's climbing out of my school. I literally had no reason for it. I was like, oh, that'd be cool. I need to do something for school. <laughs> and then my teacher was like, this is really good. I want to enter this into a competition. What does it mean? So I just kind of made up on the spot. Ah, the school obviously represents the school and the hand represents me leaving school. <laughs> and I just made it up and then won first prize. And they were like, ah, the idea behind it is brilliant. <laughs> and at that point, I, I, I think it clicked. I was like, you can just make this shit up as you go along. <laughs> like there's, you can have loads of really great ideas and be like, ah, oh, this is really deep, uh, really personal. Or you can just make some, make some art that you think is cool. And then when someone asks you what it means, just make it up. <laughs> and there's a thin line, there's not that much difference. And yeah, I guess that made me think that maybe what I had done, that piece, was good. You know, to me it felt like I just painted some random shit and then made something up for it. But it obviously resonated with some people. So like maybe to make good art, you don't even have to know that you're doing it. Hmm. You just have to do it. Yeah. I think that's the thing that sort of has always stuck with me. Yeah. I could just be a kid in a bedroom, like I can't stop. I made that when I was 20 in my bedroom. A friend who was in the room next to me was working on some music and I could hear his music and then what I was working on was mixing what, with what he did and it changed the way it sounded. Oh, wow. So I, tr so I changed my song to sound more like what he was working on. And then I Can't Stop This Man. I made it in like 45 minutes. Oh my, that's crazy. And then that song 
resonated with like the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't sitting there like, oh yeah, I'm gonna make this magnificent opus piece that's gonna be huge. Just made a song like I do on any other day. And yeah, I think it just kind of <coughs> goes to show to me that you don't need to be anyone or to be anything to make good art. You just need to do what you want to do, basically. Mm -hmm. Actually, with I Can't Stop, like, how did it get the momentum? Like, where did you <coughs> put it on originally? It was actually the third track on an EP. I always thought it was pretty good. But the record label were kind of like, it's weird. No one's ever really done anything like it. <laughs> Let's put it on as the C, the C side. So you got A, B, C, yeah. D. And then I think someone at Radio 1, a guy called Mr. Jam, liked it and passed it along to Zane Lowe, who liked it. No way. Wait, so <coughs> how did it even get to BBC? Oh, yeah, Just from yeah. your manager or from... Yeah, uh, Mr. Jam was... Like, we all had this thing called AOL Instant Messenger. Yeah. And every artist was on it. So what you do when you write a new song, you just send it to all your contacts. So I'd have, like, Russ going, Pendulum, Chase yeah. the Status, Mr. Jam, people from radio, all there. And you just make a new song, send it to everyone, and then people start playing your track if they like it. So, yeah. And I had my inbox there, and it was always open. So you check it like every evening and new people have sent you songs and yeah that's how the whole scene was born really like there was no promo you wouldn't be like oh, I'll get my manager to send this to you and let's promote this together it would just be one guy in a bedroom going on AOL it's the messenger sending a song to another guy in a bedroom crazy and then yeah so Mr Jam played it a bit and passed it along and somewhere in that mix Beyonce was listening to Radio 1 and she heard it and then passed it to Jay-Z and Kanye and yeah. then they used it. This was all when you were 20 still, like when Beyonce found and when uh, Jay-Z and yeah. Kanye sampled? 20 or 21. I remember it was, I was still at uni. That's so was, crazy, it's like you made it, like when the commercial <laughs> classmates all of a sudden within like a few weeks. Because again that follows on like seeing all this happen then it just kind of like, it cemented the idea that all of this stuff is just, it's kind of like when you grow up, you realize that you're adults. All the adults and your parents, they didn't have a fucking clue what was going on. Yeah. Now we're adults and we don't have a clue what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like no one really does. There's no barrier between someone who's got their shit together as someone who hasn't, like, everyone in the world is just sort of cobbling what they've got together and trying to make sense of it all. And I thought, oh, one day I'm going to be a professional. And that day, as, as far as they were concerned, like Jay-Z and Kenya and then the rest of the world, I was a professional. But nothing had changed. I was still just getting up, working on some music, fucking around with stuff. Like, I, I always expected there to be a changing point where I'm like, oh, I'm an adult now. And that never really happened and that was really exciting. Because I was like, oh, I don't need to do anything else now. If I'm already a professional, I can just carry on. Like, mm -hmm. I don't need to buy more equipment or get signed to this record label or, like, I don't need yeah. to achieve anything. I've got everything I need right here. And I always did from when I was eight years old playing on my little keyboard. I had everything I needed just at my fingertips. And that was such a big weight off to not think that I needed to get through some kind of invisible barrier. And I think that's the thing that I always try to promote to everyone that I come across in music is there's no line between you and who's number one right now, just a good song. Mm -hmm. right, write a song. That's it, that's all we need to do. Write some music, if you don't think it's very good, get better and write another one. There's no, sure you can spend money on social media, get these connections and do all this kind of stuff, but if you don't have a good song, none of that shit matters. So mm. just don't worry about it. Yeah. Like don't worry about trying to make it. 
you, you can now. You don't need to do anything other than just be good at writing music. Mm-hmm. And I feel quite lucky that when I was 21, that happened and it kind of made me give up. I'm trying to play the game as much and like make connections and be in with the cool guys. I just thought I can always be a guy sitting in my bedroom working on music. Yeah. It never needs to be any more than that. And that's kind of where I still am now, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what were the after effects of that song? I mean, it was so international. Did you just have to tour so much from it? And then, like, did you have, like, a lot of management? Like, how, how yeah, was so it right management. After? Before then, okay. basically we'd started the record label probably a couple of years before. Oh, okay. And my manager was also, he's a partner in the record label. So he's like, he's not really a manager. He is a part of Flux Pavilion. Yeah. Like he's been there from the start and he, he is, he does his part. I think that's the best way to always look at all this kind of stuff with your team. Like my manager, especially, but then my agent and like, social team or whoever it is they're all a part of flux pavilion we're all doing our bit together and my manager's like was there from the start so we just kind of carried on it ramped up and i did more shows but we didn't really change our perspective Mm. we were just like cool now we have more ears to share what we're doing with let's just keep going yeah So did you drop out of uni? Were you going to be a music teacher? Um, I went to uni, basically I'd made an EP, a Flux Pavilion hip hop EP, when I was 17, just out of like high school, and sent it to Ninja Tune, mm-hmm. which are like my favorite record label, and they never replied. I like put it on a CD and posted it to them and everything. And they didn't <laughs> reply, and I just went, oh shit, what do, I, what do I do now? Now, I'm just a guy sat in a small town with music. Like, if I don't put it on a label, now what do I do? And thought, I could teach. Or like, at the very least, that's, that's a way of carrying on being involved in music. Mm-hmm. So I went to university to study, because I knew, like I still thought, I'm gonna try and be an artist but you need a degree to be a teacher. Yeah. So I thought, let's, yeah, not like, just sit around <laughs> wasting my time. Like I still will need a job, so let's get a degree and work on that. And then stuck with it, so I've got my degree. Even with all this, oh, wow. I still stayed at uni because I still might be a teacher. I mean, <laughs> this is happening now, but like who knows where life's gonna go. I've yeah. kind of, I never think you should. It's one thing that's frustrating in this industry is it could all be over at any minute. Mm -hmm. Like this year, things are going well. Next year, everything could be gone. So you've got to kind of make peace with that. And you can either be really stressed out about it, be like, shit, I need to make sure that never happens. Right, I need the likes, I need to get my Instagram up. I've got to be on Twitter all the time. Or, my way of doing it is being like, I'll just be a butcher mm-hmm. or a teacher or, I don't know, go work. What, what do I want to do? I like maybe fishing. Maybe I'll just try and become a fisherman. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, it doesn't matter what I do with my life. I'll still be writing music. If my career happens to go wayward for five years or ten years, I'll just do something else and carry on writing music because... To me, writing music is the thing I like to do. Selling it, I don't really give a shit about. Sort of my manager and the label, those guys are really good at selling music. I don't have a passion for it. I don't have a passion for selling stuff and I'm not very good at it. So if I manage to, if I start writing music that they can't sell, then that's it. There's nothing else I can do. That part of my career is over until I start writing music that someone can sell again. And I just think, if I make peace with that, life is a fuckload easier yeah. to deal with. Actually, how have you dealt with all the trends <clears throat> since you started? Like, there's so many. Do you just, like, ignore it all, or do you just kind of... How do you deal with it? Or, like, keeping up with the trends to keep up with a certain <clears throat> level I, of success? I adopt the trends that I like. Mm. I think that's been always the way yeah. that I've kind of done it. I'm aware that... 
having some trendy stuff or keeping up to date with the times can help with the business side of things. So I don't want to throw it in the bin entirely because that feels stupid. But at the end of the day, I can only write music that I like. So I can only adopt trends that I like. Mm -hmm. So I just keep my ears out. And if I hear something new, sometimes I don't hear it and go, yes, cool, I'm going to be hip and trendy now. I hear it and I go, this is fucking sick. Yeah. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. I can't believe they thought of it before me. <laughs> Assholes. Right, I need to get on it. And it gives me a buzz. And I guess that's one way of staying up to date mm -hmm. is to stay excited about yeah. what you do. Kind of thing, yeah. How did you meet Marshmallow? I don't know. I knew him before he was Marshmallow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, can't, I won't say any more than that. <laughs> but I threw Marshmallow. And we did some shows in Australia. I think... That was, yeah, I'm trying to think, there's just like so many festivals all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think doing some shows in Australia was when we first kind of hung out with Feed Me as well. How did the collab come about? He, I think then, yeah, we were talking then about doing some work together. I mean, I'm, it's, <coughs> I've kind of always been a fan of him in general, but Marshmallow, it's a really annoying topic because there's so much kind of like hate against the act mm -hmm. from all the muso people but I've never got it because I'm like just listen to the guy's music I don't give a shit yeah. about all this trendy stuff and he's like selling all this brand stuff he can do whatever he wants as long as he writes good music mm -hmm. and he does his songs are great <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned He's written some of the best electronic pop songs ever. Yeah. So that, to me, while the whole whirlwind was kind of happening, <clears throat> just always sort of kept him in my peripheral vision to be like, if he hits me up, I'm in. I love that. Because normally it's like, I could get hit up by someone who is successful or someone who's hitting me up to make them more successful. I don't know, it happens quite a lot. Yeah. Where there's so much people will approach you for your name, not for your music. And I'm always kind of aware of that with some people that they don't even really care about the music that you write. They just want your name on their record. That's what they're after. And I don't get it so much because I'm kind of like, I'm always at the sidelines. I've never been like super popping. But like Diplo, I bet he gets 10 emails a day of people, they don't even care if he writes any music, they just want his name on their mm. track. So I try to stay away from that. And there are some people that I'm like, I'm not interested in getting involved in this whole kind of world. This like social, social media clusterfuck of likes and yeah. Instagram posts. You crack on with it, I just want to write some tunes. And Marshmallow toes that line where he does both. And I've always found that really fascinating. And yeah, we've just always really disagreed with anyone that dislikes what he's doing. Because yeah. I think he's using his platform to sell good music. And if you're using your platform to sell shit music, if you're doing shitty social stuff and selling shitty music, then you're just doing a shitty job. But if you're doing shitty social stuff to sell good music, then I'm fully behind that. Mm -hmm. So when he hit me up, I was like, yes. <laughs> it's kind of the opposite yeah. of what I would normally do. Because I don't like to get involved, like I say, in the whole like, clusterfuck of social media. <laughs> but, yeah, I like the way he does it. Mm -hmm. So, it was, yeah, it's an exciting thing to do. And I read in a previous interview that you had anxiety since you were really young. Yeah, since I was about 15 or 16. Yeah. I think I first started noticing it. Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you deal with it? Um, I, it's a weird thing. I first went to the doctor and I was feeling really, just feeling really weird. I didn't know what it was. It was just kind of like depressed, bleak, nervous, just all these feelings that I'd never really kind of felt before as I was getting older. And the doctor said, oh, you've got anxiety. So at that point, I thought anxiety was a disease. 
Oh, wow. I thought it was a, a thing that I'd caught, or I had, rather than, so for years and years I was like, oh, this is my anxiety. I've got anxiety. And then as I've got older and spoken to more people, I've realized that anxiety is just a reaction from your brain. Mm -hmm. It's like an, a completely natural human feeling, like happiness, sadness, anger, anxiety, excitement. It's a thing that your body does naturally. So why fight it? I should be aware that my body's feeling it, understand it, know why I'm feeling it. And if I don't want it to be there, then take a deep breath. But often, often enough now, the way I deal with it is just feel it. If I'm angry, I just am angry. Mm -hmm. If I'm sad, then I am sad. If I'm anxious, then I am anxious. It doesn't stop me from doing anything. It kind of sucks sometimes, but I don't want to be anxious. But I just found the more you fight it, the more it becomes this demon mm. that you don't want to be around. But it's not a demon. It's my body and it's my brain and it's me. My anxiety is me as much as my happiness and my music and everything else that I am. So mm -hmm. the more I push it away and try and pretend that it's not part of me, like the, yeah, the worse it gets, the more I become hyper aware of it. <coughs> mm -hmm. So now I just am anxious and fuck it. Yeah. It doesn't be change anything. How would you say has your style of music changed compared to the early songs you've made? I feel like it got weird in the middle. Hmm. When I first started, I'd be like, just doing whatever I wanted and trying to come up with something new, I think. I was trying to find my place in dubstep. And be, I don't know, it's really hard in hindsight. Because I could say that I thought all this stuff, but I don't even know what I was thinking. I just wanted to write a good tune that other DJs would play. And then, I think in the middle, like 2013 to like 2017, I was popular. So I was just trying to stay popular. Mm. <clears throat> like all the stuff I've just said. Yeah. For the past 30 minutes. <laughs> it's bullshit for those five years. Because I was mm -hmm. just trying to do collaborations with people to get my name out there trying to write music that all the all the DJs played, trying to get in the DJ Mag Top 100. Mm -hmm. Like I did it all, because I already I had it, and it was in my hands, and I was really scared of losing it. So I would make decisions based on not losing yeah. my fame, I guess. And then around last year, end of the year before, I kind of just chucked that in the bin, and was like, this is fucking exhausting. Was there a turning point for that? Um, I did a six month tour and then <clears throat> got home and was like, right, let's write another album. And I just thought, why? Why write an album? What's the point? I'm just gonna write an album, go on tour, write an album, go on tour. What's the point of all of it? Music to me is really special. And at the moment, I feel like I'm just writing it to make money. Mm -hmm. And that is like a hard pill to swallow, I guess. To be like, this is not what I'm doing this for. I'm not writing music to get shows. That's not what I wanted to do. And that's when I realized I was holding this big ball. That as the years go on, it's getting heavier and heavier. And just like, to sustain this thing, I felt like I had to sustain, like, keeping my social media going and all this kind of stuff became all of my attention was going on there and the last time I'd sat down to write some lyrics was years ago oh, wow. I hadn't picked up my guitar in four years and to sit down and actually write some music felt like a really alien thing mm. and I was like well this sucks and I'm really glad that I realised that when I'm 30 not when I'm 50 Yeah. and I was went, well fuck this shit I want to write music. That's what I'm good at, and that's what I love to do. So I don't care what it is, I'm just gonna write music. And then spent two years just writing 
anything I wanted. Not Flux Pavilion, not a genre. I'd just go in there every day and just write some music. And then out of that came this new album that I'm about to put out next oh. year. Which is just like... Oh my gosh, I was writing, so excited. But, but I wrote loads of stuff and then was like, hang on, this kind of sounds like Flux Pavilion music. <laughs> I hadn't intended on it, and then I realised that Flux Pavilion wasn't out there. Like, Flux Pavilion isn't an idea mm. that I came up with. It's not a concept or a genre. It's literally the music that I write. Yeah. That's all it is. Flux Pavilion is just me writing some music and then making it loud, basically, for a mm -hmm. dance floor. So I basically had no intention of writing Flux Pavilion stuff, and it, so it just happened. And then that's what this whole, all yeah. these new projects... That's where a lot of my words now are coming from, is the realisation that where I was at in the first place, not really giving a shit and just kind of sitting on my own, having fun writing music, is where I've ended up again, mm -hmm. just in the process of <clears throat> being like, I don't like this, I'm on Twitter all the time, following what loads of other people are doing, this makes me feel sad, fuck it, get out of it. Yeah. I'm watching the Grammys, seeing other people win awards. This makes me feel like I haven't achieved anything. Fuck it, get get rid of it. Don't care. And then all I'm left left with is music. Yeah. And I'm like sick. I this love is, this. This is yeah. what I like to do anyway. Cool. Let's do it. <clears throat> Last question. This might tie into what you were just saying, but what do you want to be remembered for? Ah. Uh, I don't know, I guess, if I'm going to be entirely truthful, I want to be remembered as one of the greatest music writers that ever lived. Mm -hmm. I mean, why, why go for any less? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I think something that's really difficult to wrangle is ego yeah. and how good you feel about yourself. I always find myself... <coughs> putting myself down, be like, oh yeah, I'm quite good, I'm all right, I'm all right, oh, I can write songs, I'll just forget about it, I, I'm not that good. But deep inside, when I'm working on a song, sometimes it feels like I've written a work of art. Yeah. And that, that doesn't last forever, that feeling goes away, and then you, you go back into like, oh, it's rubbish, oh, I don't like it, oh, that bit's not very good. But that moment when you feel like you're a genius that's like the most inspiring and the, like the best part of the writing process where you're like fuck ego, fuck the world mm -hmm. I'm great I'm really great at this so I'm trying to hone in on that more and even that I like it, that attitude doesn't belong outside of my studio like I don't think just because I'm great at writing music doesn't mean I'm any different to you or someone who is <coughs> cutting my lawn. Mm -hmm. like we're all the same shit. We're all humans. Someone could be great at one thing, shit at another thing. I happen to be good at writing music, but I'm shit at fucking talking <laughs> in public. Like, this is the most talking I do. <laughs> most of the time, I'm really shy, Aww. really nervous. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, just because I'm good at this thing doesn't mean. I'm better than anyone, but just because I've, I believe that, it doesn't mean I'm not allowed to enjoy being good at this. Yeah. And I feel like so often, yeah, we don't let ourselves enjoy what we're good at and the good version of ourselves. And I'm trying to do that mm -hmm. and just be like, if I feel like I'm a genius one afternoon, fuck it, I am. What's wrong with that? And if I want to be remembered, I want to be remembered for those moments because they are like the best parts of my day. I think. Yeah, but still now. Mm -hmm. I feel uh, I feel weird, like weirdly guilty to say it. That would be. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was awesome. Oh my god. Thank you so much. No worries. Fucking walking up this hill. <laughs>